Welcome back. Uh, if I may give one word of advice to people considering writing a chess program, don't. There are so many other programs that you would enjoy writing so much more than this. Um, I mean, that's probably the case. It, it can still be fun, just make sure that if you're going to do it, commit to it. Because, um, I don't know, like, the initial investment is not particularly rewarding, but if you really seriously commit to doing it and take it the whole, I don't know, marathon, and then take it another X marathons, um, then it starts to get rewarding. But for the average developer, um, just writing the code to be able to uh, perform the mechanics of a chess game is something that's pretty exhausting. Um, here, I admit, I'm doing something considerably more advanced. Here, what I'm going to be doing today um, is, in fact, fixing extinction chess uh, in Stockfish, which was uh, contributed um, by the same developer who contributed um, the initial Crazy House implementation into Stockfish, Fabian Fichter. Um, he contributed uh, this extinction variant as well. Um, for those not familiar, the rules of the game are that if you lose all the pieces of a given type, uh, that concludes the game. So, um, if you lose all your pawns, you lose. If you lose all your bishops, you lose and such. Um, so, what I'm doing is fixing a bug that I in accidentally introduced while merging changes um, from the official Stockfish repository into my repository. Um, this is about somewhere between the fourth and eighth hour of coding for trying to merge things from official Stockfish into my own repository. Uh, it's getting a bit exhausting at this point, but we will pursue this to the end. We will not surrender. We will make sure that we succeed. We will overcome this challenge. So the latest stumbling block here is that um, I had submitted a patch. It was not the simplest patch ever. My entire focus was just get something out there that works, that's known to work, that does not crash, that's been tested to the extent that I can test it locally. Um, I'm sorry, that to the test to the extent that I can test it manually. Um, and so I have done all that. As far as I can tell, my patch works. However, there was a concern that um, I introduced what could potentially be a bug, and that. Um, I had tried to code this based on my understanding of how bit boards are maintained within Stockfish. Turns out that if you are doing a static exchange evaluation, that is you're trying to estimate if I take there, he takes there, he ta I take there, he takes there, and so forth, all on the same capture destination. And many human players do evaluate this sort of thing you tend to keep a list in your head of pieces that you've already moved into uh, this square. So like if you say, I'm going to play pawn e4, and my opponent's going to play knight takes e4, and I'm going to play knight takes e4, they'll play bishop takes, I'll play rook takes, they'll play rook takes, I play queen takes, all on that e4 square. In your mind you keep a list of pieces that you've already moved. You want to keep a list of um, what occupancies are still on the board. Stockfish does the same thing, believe it or not. It, um, however, there's one exception, and that's if a king is performing a capture, the king occupancy from its original square is not updated. So I missed that. So the safeguard that I added to try to protect, to future-proof this against future changes is faulty which in turn means that the rest of my testing, which I had done, I 
what I had attempted to do here was say if you give up your last pawn, if you give up your last knight and so forth, that also concludes this series of exchanges. Um, either you win this series of exchanges because your opponent doesn't have any pieces left uh, to perform captures um, uh, in this form here. Um, or, so this is what pieces remain on the board that are your opponents and are any of them attacking the square um, and if not uh, I'm sorry if so you lose uh, this series of exchanges otherwise um, your opponent loses that series of exchanges um, this method does return at the very end uh, if the side to move is equal to us versus if it's equal to them that determines who wins the series of exchanges uh, for this particular capture race on a given square. Um, that's not to say that this is the best strategy for figuring out um, most valuable victim, least valuable attacker sort of ordering. It's not to say this is intelligent in any of, any of that way, but it is to say that what I had coded, uh, which is now on the master branch of my repository, um, was intended to try to do something um, sane. Um, you might have read uh, Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm going to make a humorous reference here in that there is this thing called the Total Perspective Vortex, um, where anybody going into this vortex is submitted to every possible perspective at the same time. Um, somebody submitted to that sort of thing would have figured out the ideal way to fix the bug. Um, or, honestly, somebody who was more level-headed and not in a hurry and not as tired and so forth as myself would have figured out a reasonable way to address um, what was a bug that resulted from my upstream merge. I don't need to get into all the details there uh, other than saying that upstream we'll just give a brief synopsis of what changed. Um, and I did try to do some due diligence. I fucked up. I did what I could. I don't even know how I messed it up. I'm really quite flustered about the whole thing. I had not intended to commit my weekend to trying to fix all this. Um, and I thought I had done my due diligence to make sure that in taking all these coding changes, which make the official Stockfish so much better, and I had applied all these to my own repository, um, somehow this caused um, my build to start failing, uh, probably because of this new assertion. I panicked. Um, at any rate, I did apply a fix. Here is me trying to simplify that fix to satisfy the desires and needs of the people working on our project, which is we need to be able to understand what's going on, not just have something that um, passes my own manual testing. Uh, so what I attempted to do here is say, okay, my the fix that I had applied to try to address this, namely two things. One, anti-chess, it's okay to lose your king. Two, if you have kings remaining other than the one you just moved onto the capture destination, then that's okay. Um, you can give away one of your kings. But um, I did not test that properly because the occupancy bit board does not get updated um, by, uh, sorry that I'm getting into all the details. I didn't think, but since we're this far, um, didn't think I was going to get into this. But if you are looking for the least valuable attacker to sacrifice on a square in a series of captures, if it gets to the king, this does not update the bitboard the occupancy bit board of pieces that have not yet moved into that destination. Um, so I had forgotten this one little detail, so in writing 
um, and authoring this little check here that made sure that if you had other kings remaining um, that it's okay to give away one of your kings. I uh, not consider the fact that this always returns true whenever you have any kings on the board um, because min attacker of king does not update um, the occupied bit board um, such as this min attacker does for any other type of piece that performs a movement. One way to address this would be to copy some of this code from the one function into the other function subject to the constraint or condition um, that you have more than one king remaining in which case go ahead and update occupied but then I started to think about that and think about um, really what we're needing to check here um, at least in the king of, case of two kings chess is is the king that's about to be captured a royal king um, which depends on the position of all the kings on the board even though there's only two of them but uh, anyway sorry for that long-winded rant there nobody understands that other than the few developers involved I apologize and I'll try to get this into um, terms we can all uh, agree on and understand here but basically I'm trying to explain um, there are multiple ways to try to solve the um, problem that was introduced by this new assert statement. Many other things had changed, not just in this, but in other changes that I have merged from upstream. And so I was uh, doing something ambitious. I think what I did, as far as I can tell, works, but we're going to do some testing and figure out. Um, the last little factoid that we had here is that when we attempted to perform some testing um, in extinction chess, which is not two kings chess, it's the this is back to extinction chess, the one where if you lose any all the pieces of a given type, um, that loses the game, and kings do not get checked. Although that's kind of silly because if your king gets captured, that ends the game. But um, so not having a check rule seems pretty stupid for this variant but okay um, but it's just how people play the game that's okay I guess um, at any rate when we were attempting to test this on fish test uh, it crashed on two different machines um, two of these matches ended in crashes and I attempted locally to reproduce this without performing an engine engine match um, I was not able to reproduce this from the start position. I don't know what test position to use. So the next step we're going to have to go to, um, I created a little script here to, um, this is the right branch name. This is not the right branch name. Uh, so we want the master branch and we want simple C. Um, I've been doing tons of testing, so it's possible things have changed a bit. This uh, is just a simple script to make sure that your changes don't affect um, the bench numbers for the default position. Uh, that is the series of positions in the benchmark suite for Extinction Chess, which were contributed by Fabian. In this case, for Extinction Chess, that's just the start position. Uh, for other variants, we have all kinds of uh, uh, positions to test with. Um, so, that said, um, let me first let's just dump the contents of this test script here so it says check out the master branch compile stockfish check out simple the static exchange evaluation compile stockfish again the first move the first binary into this other binary name so we can differentiate between the two and then get the benchmark numbers for each one of these and do a textual comparison um, and let's just proceed all this by getting rid of all the binaries um, and 
So if we look, um, let's see. I don't need hoard.fen anymore. Uh, what other files do we still have out? Test2.txt was my latest. Yeah, this is me just trying to figure out can I reproduce a bug at all? We'll get back to that in just a second. Um, but yeah, let's give this a whirl. Oh, I apologize. There's one thing I should do first. Um, so I'm going to stop our submission to fish test, which is running the engines against each other uh, so that I can have time to um, compile my own stuff here. And since I'm no longer running um, fish test stuff, we're going to use queue up six jobs at a time during compilation. So that's dash j6. Uh, so I had a dash j6 here. So it's going to compile using four cores, six jobs at a time. So there are always going to be two jobs pending, ready to go for the next compilation step. So let's give that a whirl. First, we're going to check out master, compile master. Second, we are going to um, check out the new branch and try to um, see if we can duplicate um, the problem that we experienced in the other context where um, where the engine was crashing on other people's machines. Um, I have been trying... I'm pretty sure at some point I did check out this branch and did attempt to... I've certainly built that like a dozen times and run all kinds of tests against it. However, I've not run this latest test here um, where you just set up the start position and go infinite on it. I've not done that um, today, so I need to do that today. Uh, but we see that the benchmark number, it has actually changed um, between the master branch, which attempts to do a more intelligent strategy than the simple version. Um, namely, his simple version, this is the diff that we looked at at GitHub, um, is only concerned with if I'm giving away my king and the sequence of captures. So it's less accurate at detecting, or at least in theory this is less accurate at detecting um, sequences of captures that will lose the game. But this is a lot simpler code because, um, let's see, it's this thing here. So this is essentially what I'm doing, is saying um, this is the heart of this patch. Is that if you are giving away your king, trigger the uh, sequence here. Balance equals minus balance minus one minus... Oh, I'm sorry. Let me look at this in the context of... Um, can we get there? Now, here we are. Found it. So, originally, there weren't any of these if or end if statements here. It just used to say the balance, that is, uh, how much material I've gained or lost in this sequence of captures. It depends on the values of all the pieces that have been captured in the sequence. And this determines if um, either player has turned a profit and can stop capturing right now. For example, if I've played pawn e4, you've played queen takes pawn, I've played pawn takes queen, you've played rook takes pawn, I've already taken your queen, so I don't need to keep capturing things. It's okay for me to stop there. Um, so that's the sort of thing that this is checking, is has one player made a profit somehow? Um, that said, uh, that example doesn't exactly follow what this code would do, but just hypothetically um, 
more accurate would be I play pawn e4, you play rook takes pawn, I play pawn takes rook, you play rook or queen or something takes my other pawn. I don't care because I've already profited. Namely, you shouldn't have taken my pawn in the first place with your rook because giving up the rook um, for two pawns isn't a very bright move. Um, what I had to add to this is that if a player is performing a king captures a pawn, um, then we also need to terminate the sequence. Um, and if that center square has the king under attack, um, then the player who played king takes pawn or king takes whatever is going to lose. Otherwise, they win the sequence. They've profited. Um, so this is all based on the new rewritten static exchange evaluation code. Um, so this is um, so in terms of comparing to uh, what was on the master branch yesterday versus um, well this is what the patch looks like um, but if you compare this to current master current master has all this other complicated stuff on there based on detecting has my opponent given away all their pieces of a given type and if so that ends the sequence immediately and I win because um, extinction chess is about losing all of your pieces of a given type. Um, the other wrinkle, which is what kind of drove me to get into this in the first place, and unfortunately this is kind of confusing, is that in extinction chess, giving away a king does not necessarily end the game because pawns can promote to kings, and kings can move into check and all that good stuff. Not that you'd ever want to move a king into check, but if you have more than one, okay, maybe it makes sense to do so. Uh, if you have exactly one king remaining, you'd be an idiot to put your king in check because you just lose the game. They just take your king. Um, but it's legal to do so, um, unfortunately. Um, as it is legal to put any of your last piece of any type into a threat even though that like basically instantly loses the game because your opponent captures it right away it's legal to do that because otherwise um, user interfaces would suggest to humans um, winning moves basically or not winning moves but good defensive moves so what this all comes around to um, we did run um, just while we were here, we ran the bench numbers on the start positions, and we saw here that um, the number of positions searched differs on master versus on this branch here, where I'm claiming that um, this branch does less intelligent things for these capture sequences, but we need to do testing to prove that out. But the whole point of this exercise is to write the simplest possible patch so it can be compared to master. And um, if it's if the simplest patch uh, also fixes the bug, then that's the one we should prefer, unless we can demonstrate that the more complicated patch is better and it's safe to release, which is complicated. So we don't need to get into that at the moment. But um, if as I suspect, um, this simpler patch that says it's never okay to give away a king, um, the simpler patch, oh, what was I going to say? Should it fail um, to, uh, I'm sorry, should the current strategy be dominant, then we need to enhance this simpler patch to integrate the logic that's currently on the master branch which says you can't give away all your knights, you can't give away all your bishops and so forth in a capture sequence. So, and that's not going to be hard to do. Honestly, anybody could have done that. Um, but we have to test things in order so we can understand um, whether or not the overly complex strategy is merited. But first, um, we need to verify that this simple patch, the one that we just looked at here, the one that says a king can never capture in a sequence unless the opponent's piece is undefended, we need to verify that that works. Um, 
So how do we verify that? Here's our test. Set the variant to extinction chess, set the start position, go infinite. Not a perfect test. Uh, it's a simple test to run, however. And I thought I ran this yesterday. Certainly we'll run it today, just in case somehow my code has changed at some point. Um, um, the other thing we can test here um, since this test actually takes a while, uh, let's get our other parameters like threads and hash. So test2.txt set option name threads value 4. We'll set uh, hash size to 64 megabytes. Um, so this will allow us to run tests a bit faster. We'll run four threads at a time, looking for, this is not multi-PV mode, not multiple principal variations, but now we've got all our cores running the engine all at once um, with the 64 megabyte hash. And the goal is to see, I don't know, do we get to like depth 30 or something? And have we managed to crash the engine? Because what was reported was that during play on this match and on this match an engine crashed. Doesn't say which one, but a crash did occur. So we're suspecting um, that it's the simple patch that crashed. Again, we don't know that. Um, so it very well could have been the master engine that crashed. Um, so here we are at depth 24, still churning and burning. And um, honestly, this is this could take minutes or hours to reach depth 30. Uh, probably minutes. I could probably filibuster for a bit here. Um, tests I've run so far were only for single-threaded stockfish running with a 16 megabyte hash. Um, table. So, um, and that's because I was running all my other threads running stockfish um, with the fish test cluster. Um, that is running all these other tests that are currently ongoing on a variety of uh, computers. I was contributing to this pool. For purposes of this development stream, I've taken us out of that pool, although I'll add us back in when we're done. Um, but um, we are able to check in and see for Horde Chess, is this patch sufficient? Subject to this particular test, which says, am I more likely to lose 10 ELO or more likely to gain 5? Uh, I think this is a simple progressive ratio test. I probably have that wrong. But the um, even if I have the name of that wrong, the purpose of this test is to see uh, out of two hypotheses, am I more likely to reject the hypothesis that I'm losing ELO, that I'm losing 10, or more likely to reject the hypothesis that I'm gaining 5? Um, and for most patches, you're probably not going to lose 10 ELO. Uh, for this particular patch, for a horde chess where a player only has a single king, um, yeah, you're not likely to lose um, 5 ELO. Or, not, I'm sorry, not likely to lose 10 ELO because you have only one king to give. Um... What was it that I wanted to test, though? I think Horde was the incorrect variant for this test submission. It was Extinction and Two Kings that I was intending to test. Why did I submit one for Horde? I mean, it's good that this regression is taking place, um, but that was an unnecessary test on my part. I should have submitted one for Two Kings. Let's submit one for two kings, right? There's not. I didn't queue one up, right? Right. So, um, 
So we got to submit some test here for two kings. Simple C for this bench number, which is unchanged. Uh, is considered a simplification because we're getting rid of these two kings lines of code. Um, using the two kings opening book. Um, this is what I meant to submit. Sorry that I'm kind of loopy at the moment submitting these tests. There's like so many fields on this form, it's so easy to make a mistake if you're not completely focused on what you're doing. And I do my best to try to stay focused, but submitting this form is the last step of a very long process of developing changes and publishing them to GitHub and such. So, um, in which I'm doing all kinds of local tests before I even push the code to GitHub, and then making sure I've pushed it correctly to GitHub, making sure afterward that the code diff here is what we think it is. Well, it turns out I hadn't actually submitted the correct variant name. I submitted Horde instead of Two Kings. So we do need to submit this as well for Two Kings. Uh, saying that sacrificing a king in the capture sequence is not acceptable. Um, so simple C, default parameters, correct signature versus master, uh, SPRT, 10, 5, uh, two kings. Yeah, this is all correct, so we'll submit that. And then we see that this appears in the queue and needs to be approved by the queue maintainer. That's okay. So what I intended to show here was us seeing the two kings results, which would have been more interesting. This should pass without a problem because this actually isn't a functional change. This is a code change for Horde Chess, so there is still some point in testing it, but it's not a functional change. So there should not be any problem here, unless I fucked up somehow, which I don't think I did. But it's still good to test it. Um, it's just not as urgent as these other variants where we made tons of these code changes. Um, okay, so we hit depth 32. Um, so the simple SEE, uh, this branch that we're currently on, is um, apparently not failing that test. Now we'll run stockfish base, which was the master branch. Um, the reasoning for the name's base versus um, just the plain old engine without any kind of qualification at the end of its name is that there are utilities which use this nomenclature of base versus, um, um, I don't know, not base. Um, so I'm using that same nomenclature here, even though really it is master versus patch or whatever, but we'll use base versus not base to uh, keep the names separate. So this should only take a couple minutes. Um, again, I don't think out of the start position we're ever going to see this crash right away. Um, the test in which this did crash, for what it's worth, was us playing at this time control of 10 seconds plus one tenth of a second per move using this particular opening book so I'll have to download that in advance of doing the stream I had already taken the liberty of um, let's go to my repositories uh, where is it repositories huge chess I understand my branch is 27 commits behind master. Oh, behind cute chess master. Okay, but I was looking for... Um, actually, no, cute chess master is right. I had taken the liberty, though, of downloading this, all the latest changes, which include all the latest, greatest variants and stuff. Um, I have locally downloaded this. I should actually push my local downloads to my own repository even though I'm not well what I should do is check what branches am I maintaining um let's see 
because if all my changes have been accepted, um, I did not create this branch. I did not create this. I did not create this. I created giveaway. Um, what changes did I make on this branch? Add giveaway variant support. Okay, we're going to actually check if this change had made it into the master branch. Um, I'm going to take a leap of faith here and say, oh, no, I need to be patient with it. It's just this is so much slower than um, the other branch. Yeah, let's just run an engine versus engine match and figure out how that goes. Um, but taking the step here uh, in the cute chess library of downloading all the latest greatest changes. Um, so what I'm curious of is did my giveaway branch make it into um, cute chess? If not, does cute chess support giveaway chess at all? What happened to my submission? Did I pull request this? Okay. Uh, okay, so it sure looks like uh, get fetch my name give a way okay and we'll say get branch delete uh, give away get check out give away if I can spell it check out master can I delete this branch because no it's not been mer oh yes deleted successfully which does mean that my submission all my changes for giveaway chess are actually in the repository or were at one point point. and regardless um, I mean clearly this supports giveaway chess otherwise um, we would not have uh, the variant here when you go submit a new test. Uh, we have tested this, we've used it before. Where is it? Here it is. Giveaway versus what Lee Chess calls anti chess, which everybody else calls giveaway. Um, or suicide chess or whatever. But um, they make differentiations between the various forms of anti chess, whereas Lee Chess only calls this hybrid weird thing that they do, they call it anti-chess. Um, but the important aspect here is that this branch has been merged, um, which in turn means I don't really need to maintain a copy of this repository at all. Sorry I'm bouncing around a bit. Uh, chess. So because um, my only branch in GitHub has already been promoted upstream and I don't need to maintain a copy of this repository on GitHub because I have one locally on my Linux box. All my changes have been already merged, um, namely this one, so that's already been merged, I can delete that. But furthermore, since I don't have any submissions or changes or anything to Cute Chess, I don't need to maintain this repository for Cute Chess anymore. Um, all my changes have already been submitted upstream, so I don't need this. Uh, I'm not maintaining that right now. Um, so there we go. Cute Chess has been deleted on GitHub. We'll just use the upstream repository. Get remote dash v. Uh, get remote delete. Uh, actually, remove like that. And here we go. So there it is. Origin get branch v etc. So 
we have the latest master version of Qt Chess. Um, uh, I've downloaded that in advance of this stream. So now, um, now if I can remember the right way to use it. Um, oh, here we go. We're going to copy that script. Two kings dot sh is going to become extinction dot sh. Uh, two kings is extinction. There we go. Um, let's see. Instead, of, yeah, 240 moves um, in a tenth of a second plus a tenth of a second per move is not the time control we were using. So this should accurately reflect um, the parameters of the test that was done on Git on um, fish test. Um, we're dumping all the games to extinction.pgn. Not that that should be necessary. How many matches? It's just one game, right? Hmm. I don't see it doing a series of games. So I think this is just a single game. Um, so next we need to go get the opening books, which if I remember right, oh, where did I put it? Locate books, Greplila, um, yeah, fish, net, SPSA, books, get branch, um, Get remote, get pull origin master. Uh, so there we go. We got the latest opening books. That's a lot of books. Copy extinction back to the home directory. Um, so we've got extinction.epd, the set of opening positions. Um, which is probably not that many. Here's the first few. I don't know how many there are in there. We could see. The number of lines in the file is... Uh, okay. It's about 3,000 opening positions for Extinction Chess. Um, and here we go. Here's... Um, yeah. I think this is fine. So this should allow us to run a game between two engines at the time control of 10 seconds per 240 moves. Just close enough to 10 seconds per game as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay, started game one of one. Um, and we'll see if this goes for a little bit and crashes or something. I don't actually have visibility to the live PGN file, though that would be a kind of nice feature if that were possible. And a time control which adds a tenth of a second per move. It has 10 seconds per player at the start of the game. Yeah, that should end very, fairly quickly probably under 30 seconds per game. Um, here we are. I had it print out the contents of the PGN file upon completion. Um, so we see white wins. Um, I have to remember um, how is it that we do a series of games? I have an example here somewhere. Oh, G Drive. It was my initial attempt to get games relayed over to um, Lee Chess using Google Drive. And we did use this back in December for relaying um, the... Uh, I'm sorry, I used this for prototyping a match. Um, ultimately, it was... Uh, it was the tournament organizer 
whoever that fellow was. Marco? No. No, it's not. Oh my goodness, I am blanking. We're gonna look this up, because I'm an idiot. Um, I mean that in the most affectionate way, but... Uh, computer tournament... Ferdinand was his name. Ferdinand Mosca ran this event. Um, so here was the candidates tour for the event. Uh, he did manage to relay some of these games through great effort on his part. Uh, I certainly appreciated that, although I've been overwhelmed and have not had a chance to annotate these games yet. I do intend to get around to doing it, but we did relay this match on Lee Chess. Even though Lee Chess didn't officially put it on their broadcast page, we did actually manage to use a broadcast feature and watch and commentate live on the games, which is very exciting, with a live PGN file. And I believe we did achieve that through Google Drive or something like that. So this is my attempt to set up in preparation for the Stockfish versus Immortal match. Um, we had quite the decisive result because Stockfish has just been exploding. It's the newest competitor on the scene here. Um, although lately it's not been surging upward in rating as much as competitors have. Um, it's still at the top of the chain for now. Um, so, anyway, this is my prototype to prepare for that. What I was looking for here is how do I run more than one game um, with two engines against each other. Okay, so the parameter that I was looking for is dash rounds, and then some number of rounds. So... Um, actually, why don't we take a look at it this way. Uh, we're going to grab this line of code, uh, dump it down here, and replace the word crazy house with extinction. Um, now, I understand that Sunsetter does not support Extinction Chess, uh, nor should it, but let's see, how do I change my command up top to look more like the command below it? Um, rounds, let's say 10, variant extinction, openings, file, format. <laughs> yeah, for my testing, I had to use a PGN file instead of... Uh, EPD position descriptor. I needed the full move list, which required me to have the PGN file. Uh, otherwise, Lee Chess wouldn't accept the game from... It doesn't... Lee Chess doesn't support the concept of having a variant game that started from a non-standard start position. So, for my own relaying back in December, I had to create a PGN file of opening positions. No big deal. Um... Oh, hang on, hang on. So, we need stockfish uh, base. Oh man, if I could name the two separately, that would save me a great deal of headache. I forget what's the command to name each engine that's participating in the match. Um... Anything else I need to do here? Yeah, they both use the UCI Universal Chess Interface Protocol. I think these two commands look similar enough. Um, I'm still missing uh, tail extinction PGN. Um, I'm missing something here. I am missing the name for each engine. So, 
I believe if you run cute chess, uh, is it double dash help or dash help or something? Here you have a list of, okay, engine name equals name. Um, and I think you need to provide that within the context of the engine specific parameters. So um, command equals base, uh, name equals master, uh, name equals patch. Okay, so whatever, we'll name it after the actual branch name just to be consistent. So now, um, whoops. So there's our command to run the engine engine match for 10 games and watch the results file as it's being published. Um, I think that's as good as it's going to get. This shouldn't take too long, I hope. So without further ado, let's get a doing. Um, cannot open file for reading. Um, yeah, dash F with the capital F means follow uh, the file, not only as it exists on the current file system, but keep polling for or keep a watch on the file system in case a file with that name does appear in this given directory or in the defined path structure. Okay, so there it is. It says following new file. So game one is concluded. There has not been a crash. Game two will commence. Post haste there. Um, if after 10 games we don't see a crash occur, then the next logical step um, is to try performing a different sort of build, even though it's not, I don't think it's going to change anything. Um, what I was doing for my own testing. Oh, here we go. Stalled connection. Uh, Black's connection stalls. That's exactly what we were looking for. So it was master that crashed. Okay, that was the relevant piece of data we needed. What this in turn means is that master um, could stall, which is not the conclusion we wanted to reach. It's not one I wanted to suggest to Fabian, who had already commented a number of things about um, and he's completely right, but um, Master should not get into these lost positions in the first place, but uh, in the event that it, by some random happenstance, it ha happens to be playing against a very strong opponent who somehow outwitted it, um, yeah, this, this sort of thing can occur. It's not very likely to occur. Uh, it's, but it's a possibility. But what all this in turn means is that when I submit this test for extinction chess, I need to submit it in a slightly different way. Um, whoops. So we're saying I want to test this patch not against master, but against. Um, the ancestor, the, I'm sorry, the parent of master here. Okay. Uh, we've already looked at that. Um, let's see, let's go back here. Here's our latest commit. We're already one behind upstream, that's okay. Here's um, the, uh, I'm sorry, here's the commit number we want to, the branch we want to test against. Um, for standard chess, this bench number has almost never changes. No, I'm sorry, it never changes in my own development. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, so what this is going to mean is that we're going to test this not against the latest master, but against the parent, the one that did not contain my enhancement to try to improve um, move ordering for, um, that tried to improve static exchange evaluation. Um, so we're just going to do a straight-up comparison with the parent, which didn't do anything smart, which in fact does, um, not to put too heavy a point on it, but what had me concerned in the first place uh, was that the Travis builds uh, were failing and that the AppVayor builds were containing the failing executable. Namely that... Here we had some results that um, all our builds were uh, failing. This is our continuous integration server to let us know when I fucked up. Uh, I fucked up here. Well, how did I do so? It's because, again, at the beginning of the stream, I should have connected the dots for you, but this new assertion is something that's tested by Travis, but is not tested by AppVayor. Um, I struggled to connect all the dots uh, in my haste to try to fix these issues. So here we are, AppVayor has been just um, distributing builds reliably, as it always does. But some of these builds, um, I'm sorry, all those builds um, do are not debug builds, those are release builds. but. For Travis, I have this configured to exercise all the assertions and let us know when assertions fail um, on our uh, benchmark positions. Namely, what we do, this isn't too complicated, so bear with me. Um, how do I demonstrate this? Yeah, so what we do is, for example, be, and what Travis does, something like this where it says we're going to run stockfish um, bench all and this just runs all the benchmark positions uh, to a depth of 13 plies um, this is for a number of purposes one to make sure that your code changes don't cause these tests to take forever Two, to ensure that you've got test coverage for a wide variety of positions and for variants. And three, if you ha are exercising these tests in debug mode, to trip up as many assertions as possible um, so that you can know if there's potential for something to go wrong. For example, if a player can have their king being captured, which in standard chess is not allowed. In anti-chess, it's totally cool. In other variants, it depends. Um, but anyway, I've lost um, my point here that I was trying to raise like a minute or two ago. Um, let's see. But I think this is okay. Uh, Yeah, my point is that we're testing here. Oh, I was saying that I was trying to fix um, the assertion problem, and I made it worse by failing to test my changed assertion. Um, I didn't have a good test position available. I wasn't entirely clear on how to test this. Um, and I, I don't know. I messed up in my testing there. So it's possible that this here code and or code up here uh, is doing stuff it shouldn't be doing. That's the point. So we need to use not master but the parent commit and make sure that this works. Um, what we're trying to test now is simple C, namely just this tiny little change here. Um, 
is can I, um, I'm sorry, the point of this is can I do this if I'm about to sacrifice a king, or if a king is about to perform a capture, then we need to fall into the routine at the very end of this method, which says um, if the balance is still non-negative, then uh, we win. Uh, so yeah, if you've already made a material profit after your opponent has captured or something of that sort, then we win. And the only thing to decide is, um, have we lost our king in the process of making a material profit? Because the king doesn't have a value. Unless you're playing variants like uh, Horde Chess, where the king actually does have a value. And why it has a value there so that we can evaluate who's better. Not because the king itself can be captured. So, that's the most long-winded explanation ever. Um, we'll see if this patch gets tested here. Um, we'll see how these other test results go. Let's see, here's two kings regression test. This is dating back to the beginning of February. I'm not sure why some of those didn't get tested till now. We did identify a atomic chess bug. However, this is not an undefined behavior bug, but simply an ELO loss of about 100 points. I'm not so concerned about ELO losses because those are easy to fix. Undefined behavior is difficult to fix because um, you have to figure out how to define behavior in a way that can't introduce side effects. Correcting ELO losses is the easiest thing to patch. Either you figure out a good way to fix it or it's just not something you can fix. Um, but almost always it's in the first category of the bug is obvious and it's clear how to improve the code, etc, etc. Um, so we've looked at this patch, this code diff long enough. Okay, can I add a comment here? Nope. Can I add a comment here? Okay. I duplicated the crash locally and submitted a different test. Uh, okay, so I think that's fine. Again, he could give me grief, or he could take the high ground. Throughout our arguments, I've been polite, although opinionated, but respectful, and he's had the courtesy of being the same. I'm not claiming any sort of high ground or anything, because I certainly don't have it, but we're friends here. We don't tear each other apart, although we have very strong disagreements at times. It's okay. Even though I fuck up at times, it's okay. I mean, it's my repository. I'm doing the best I can to try to maintain and take care of it. It's all a volunteer project anyway, so it's kind of silly for... But, I mean, it's good for us to be opinionated and have informed discussions, even if our we don't see eye-to-eye -eye on everything. We do collaborate and make great things possible. We do agree on principles, just not on priorities all the time, but that's okay. Um, it's a perfectly fine and legitimate and right and best and correct and everything like that that we disagree at times. It's okay. We don't need to agree on everything. It's. I'm not... I, I don't know how to try to be more respectful. Because we are friends and we do achieve excellent things together even if the paths by which we might imagine getting there are a bit different, we have a common vision. Um, so, 
Uh, I should include the URL for this new test. Here it is. Uh, okay. We'll see if he accepts that. He really, I expect he will. He's level headed and such. So, thus ends, um, I think, the end of a successful troubleshooting session. What really I should be testing at present is um, does this particular parent. Um, I mean, there's no reason, no need for me to test this, but if I'm being just anal retentive about it, I should test this locally before submitting it. But um, what we, the point to testing that would be is that without these lines of code, um, does it still crash? Namely, does what was on master before yesterday is that also subject to crashing? And if so, we just have no way of testing this patch because both master and this um, crash, which there's no way that's the case. But if there it is, uh, then we're fucked because <laughs> something upstream that we merged is forcing us to keep going back up and up and up through our history until we find something that's stable. And honestly, my personal take is like, we have something that's defined here. Let's take the bird in the hand. This is the defined thing. Let's just use it. And if we want to try to improve from that, we can improve from that. But that's my opinion. Certainly, if you're doing enterprise level software, if you're doing this for commercial purposes and such, do all your testing first. Have a most rigorous testing structure, framework, etc., infrastructure already in place. Don't take this um, gung-ho approach of just committing things and testing them later. Test them first, if you're doing this for commercial use and such. Um, as this is just an amateur project, and as I'm only committing my free time, which is somewhat limited to this, um, I do not always follow best commercial software practices with this repository, nor am I paid in any way to do whatever I'm doing here. It's just a fun repository I maintain. Um, so this concludes like hour eight of me trying to patch shit here. Um, coding is hard. Oh, but one thing I observed while we were doing all this coding here is it's we see you have we're one commit behind upstream master. Um, I can certainly keep my pants on and not like merge this right away, but I am curious what it is. So let's take a look. What fresh hell awaits us next? <laughs> um, only I only say that because. Um, during this year, they're making some more aggressive um, merges. I I'm saying that in the most affectionate possible way. It's C++ makes things difficult. Um, well, no. C++ did its best over many years to make things easy. Um, although it's a very complex language. Newer languages will someday replace it in many respects. Unfortunately, Rustfish, um, the Rust um, analog equivalent, etc. I'm not sure what the right word is for the Stockfish chest engine. Rustfish is still. Um, I mean, it works. It runs. I've downloaded it. it it's just a bit slower than um, Stockfish at the moment. Uh, Ronald DeMann is doing excellent, brilliant work with Rustfish. I did fork his repository today. I don't have time to add all these variants into Rust. I don't even understand the mechanics of the language of Rust. I do understand that um, uh, it's Rust is a language that um, has been given ample consideration in its design. Um, 
and features are not added until they are very well thought about for many weeks and months of discussion. In C++ that was also the case, but C++ has all these backward compatibility issues and concerns. Rust doesn't have that. Rust is a new language. It has the liberty of doing things differently and better. So um, the idea would be that someday we can port all these variant changes from Stockfish into Rustfish and um, get a better understanding of how to write idiomatic Rust code um, and hopefully find that it's easier to maintain the engine inside Rust than it is in C++ um, for no other reason than um, maybe it could be more concise or not have to worry about all these weird boundary conditions um, or have better ways to express them um, anyway uh, so let's take a look at upstream they're paying all kinds of technical debt this year because last year I believe they did not win some TCEC event um, they did quite well but um, the amount of code that was added last year was amazing and the amount of code that's being removed this year is equally amazing um, removed in the sense that they're finding better ways to rewrite existing code um, perhaps having looked at the TCEC games is inspiring them to find ways to improve Stockfish anyway got this multi-paragraph comment here which I've been putting off reading but we really need to read it when internal iterative deepening is invoked the prior value of transposition table value is not guaranteed to be value none as such it is currently possible to enter a state in which TT value is, a is see it's this kind of thing um, and yes you can write rust code that suffers from these same problems but um, the beauty I think in Rust is that you'd be able to somehow express um, I don't know in Rust you might have more flexible ways of structuring your data and or structuring your tests to help prevent against these kind of problems in the first place and or the language and its idiom might make it more obvious when you're doing something that's not idiomatic to Rust and that will give you pause to think about maybe there's a better way to do this um, but yeah in uh, C++ inside Stockfish we certainly need to be careful about all these boundary conditions such as entering a state in which TT value has a specific value is just inconsistent with the bound in wait what um um, hmm. inconsistent with the bound and depth you know that reminds me that reminds me sorry for the switching between the black and white and the black and the white here but I've got this issue where we've got inconsistencies in evaluations and depths and such um where we're finding that um, for non-primary principal variations we're not even sure this is a bug um, but we've evaluated a variation and then after having evaluated it we're printing uh, upper bound instead of printing the value um, and I don't even know why it might be right that we're printing upper bound because our we've maybe refuted a variation or something like that I don't know um, but all these inconsistencies certainly could contribute toward our own issue with printing variations not saying that is the case but just like every time one of these sorts of things happens it brings me back to this question which I don't have an ability to answer and uh, I don't think I've seen this with upstream stockfish I don't remember um, 
I think more recently I found a test position. I should actually try this with official stockfish and see does official stockfish have the same problem that we have on my own. And if it does, does this fix it? Um, and if not, should we submit this upstream and ask them what are your guys' thoughts about printing upper bound instead of printing an evaluation? Although we're doing custom things to print the variation or print the um, output anyway. Um, so, this is for a transposition move to be a singular extension candidate, singular extension needs to be true. With the current master, this requires these conditions. This is not currently possible if the transposition table evaluation comes from internal iterative deepening. Since the depth used for the search is always less than this expression, uh, however, with this branch, something, something, this condition can be met, uh, then there are two mechanisms by which this patch can affect search. One, if transposition table value was value none prior to deepening, uh, the fact that this patch sets transposition table value allows the condition to be met. Two, if it wasn't set prior to deepening, um, the fact this patch modifies the value causes a different R beta to be calculated um, should we choose to perform a singular extension search. Um, so the two mechanisms by which this patch can affect search. So if we had a value of none as a no value, I think, or is that value, well it's not value zero, that's value none, that's an undefined value. Uh, this um, allows a singular extension node to be satisfied. If tt value wasn't none, if we had a value previous to deepening, the fact that this modifies the value changes the r beta which is calculated for the purposes of the search. Um, tested for non-regression. So last year, a great many patches were submitted, um, not as simplifications, not as non-regressions and such, but were submitted as enhancements. And the code kind of exploded last year. Lots of changes got added. This year, there's a lot more reflection, at least this winter there is, on um, what are better ways that we can do existing things. Um, so I do appreciate these comments, at least try to explain the motivation. Um, so the point here, um, when you're doing deepening, is that the prior value is not guaranteed to be none. And so you can get into this state where TT value has um, a specific value that's inconsistent with TTE bound and TTE depth. So, namely, the values in the transposition table could be out of, they could be stale with respect to the depth and um, bounds with which you're trying to search. Um, and so this changes that by allowing iterative deepening to populate this value of tt value. Um, and having populated it, um, or populated it here. Um, mm, I'm sorry, having populated it, um, that allows singular extension search later on to be performed somewhere down here. I forget where. Um, what most confuses me about all of this Wait, these are hundreds of lines of code apart. If I expand this a little bit, unfortunately it only unfolds the bottom part. Whoops. Uh, let's keep expanding this. Because I'm actually curious what lies just beyond the top part here. 
Right, so I'm wondering why this um, was different than the block far below it. Oh, here's the singular extension code, by the way. So this is saying update the value of, or I'm sorry, update the va variable here based on the value that's already in the transposition table, if there is one. Um, because we're also getting the move out of the transposition table if there is one for this position. If we remember what the best move is, remember not only the move, but also what the value was uh, at the last time that this got updated. If, if value from TT has a value at the given depth. So if this was updated recently enough, then use the value that was most recently updated. Um, probably more, well, I don't, I can't begin to speculate as to when that's useful when it isn't. Um, although all the comment up there does so. But the point here is that if the transposition table's been updated, use the new value. Because um, as long as that value searched at a deep enough depth, if it did not, search at a deep enough depth, then um, use value none instead, like we used to be doing. Or use whatever the value of TT value used to be. Um, so that allows singular extension search to be performed on positions where we looked up a move out of the transposition table. And this I think is just a reordering of statements to match the ordering of statements at the top I don't know what the point is of um, why you would need to do TT move assignment after TT value assignment, because I think these are independent operations. Um, but regardless, those statements are now in the same order in both blocks of code. They're both consistently using the transposition table. This does look like a more consistent way to use the code. People on the mailing list are where they discuss all these little details are in agreement that that should have been submitted at these parameters. This was submitted. It did not regress. Um, we see it had 17,060 wins, 17,048 losses. So it's not regressing um, at a slow time control, right? Uh, I'm sorry, at a short time control. At a short time control, this does not regress. At a long time control, it's probably fine, honestly. So, yeah, I think this is a reasonable change. Honestly, this huge comment did scare me into thinking I shouldn't be merging this right away. But it is, like... This can't possibly break anything. We already have all the assertions in place to test for breakage anyway. Um, we know that this doesn't regress for standard chess. Um, but I'll... <laughs> I'm, I'm anxious. I'm chomping at the bit as somebody curious about how can this improve things. Um, I'm really wanting to merge this as soon as possible, but this fixes side effects um, or changes side effects that were present uh, upstream. So um, even though I think this is a better way to do things, I need to hang on and wait until all these tests um, complete successfully uh, until we've got fixes in for um, oh, what's it for horde chess until atomic chess has been fixed until um, I really don't want to wait because I think this change improves stockfish overall and this change isn't going to break anything. On the other hand, um, just given the deep water we're in already, I 
it's probably best that we take care of the small problems first and then focus on the big one later. Um, I really want to merge that immediately. It's almost certainly safe to merge. It's not going to cause any problems. In fact, it, it fixes perceived problem. Well, no. Fixes is too strong a term. To prove that it actually fixes something, you'd have to write a test indicating how it fixes something. I think any level-headed person, any level-headed scientist would agree that um, this patch um, is more consistent in its usage of TT probe, etc., etc., and how it's used um, for singular extension search, or before a singular extension search, and used in this other context. Uh, and that we're doing the same thing now in both contexts. That whenever we're accessing the transposition table, we're also using the value that was stored in the table. Why would you use the move and not use uh, the transposition table value is beyond me. Um, and surely there is a way to define some sort of test where the engine loses games or loses on puzzles or something of that sort or just takes longer. Um, surely there's some way to define a test that defines that this strategy is superior. Uh, the project maintainers and developers were in agreement this is a good patch. Um, but there's so many other variables up in the air at the moment, I can't afford to merge it right away, even though I very much want to immediately merge it. So, I guess I'll just be patient. Being patient's hard. Um, so how's this going? Um, so, this was our terminated test due to the crashes. Here we got Chantrage and Two Kings and all this other stuff. Here, um, <laughs> we correctly observe that there's, I'm sorry, we observe that there's a regression in atomic chess due to the way that I merged something upstream. We could take a look at that next here. Why don't we do that? Um, and Fabian did helpfully point out, um, where was it? Where was it? Uh, atomic? Nope. Uh, was it the parent? Nope. That uh, was something. Maybe it was on my new branch. Branches, simple. Uh, is this it? Oh, I'm sorry, it was on my other simple C patch. Fabian did point out that um, this here change is thought to regress for atomic chess because um, oh, now I remember. Let's take a look at this inside um, get branch I'm sorry, get, yeah, branch dash v, get log, um, get diff, uh, I'm sorry, get checkout master, get diff uh, to what was before it, no, that's not it, get log, um, this thing. Get diff to, before we started merging anything, what changed? Uh, specifically in position.cpp, what changed? Was, and we looked at this in GitHub already, in some level of detail. Um, oh, but I want to 
do is do a comparison with white space changes ignored. Um, so somewhere toward the end of this file, uh, where is that castling right? Uh, set check info. Oh wait, this isn't it. Get log. Um, <laughs> maybe this one. I don't know. Yeah, somehow I'm not managing to pull up the diff correctly. So we'll take a look at this from a slightly different angle. Um, so here we have our function simple exchange evaluation greater than or equal to threshold. Um, which changed in the respect that um, this function is now capable of returning early when that's a bad thing. And where is that a bad thing, you might ask? Um, here, I think. Yeah, these early return statements are... I'm sorry, this early return statement is fucking us up, potentially. Uh, so what? how we could fix this potentially would be uh, saying, if we're doing atomic chess, um, don't allow for an early return, I think. Yeah, I think this is, I think the previous version of this code did something similar to what we're doing here. Unfortunately, I had to move things around as I was merging upstream changes, and I missed this one condition here by which there's an early return. Um, the comment here is um, uh, assume the worst case where the opponent just captures our piece and we lose it for nothing. Oh, so here it is. Yeah, that the opponent can capture our piece for free. Well, in atomic chess, you can't do a capture for free. So, um, oh, hang on. So what that actually means, jeez, what a mess. Um, now, am I, how am I calculating balance down here? If our move is a capture, do it this way. Else, um, blast eval is equal to value zero. Um, <laughs> let's see. I don't need to make a variable called blast eval, by the way. Um, so everything within a blast radius of the destination, that's not a pawn, um, excluding the origin square of the move, and excluding... Hmm. So what's that about? Why am I defaulting this to zero? <sighs> what's going on here? Everything that's in the blast radius, excluding the piece that's performing the capture, is counted in the blast. But perhaps... Um, So next victim is our piece. 
Right. So it's okay to have um I'm just debating can I first of all set that equal to balance to indicate that our piece is the one being captured. Um piece value piece on square. That's our opponent's piece that's performing the capture. Minus piece value moved. Um, now hang on a second. The moved piece is this one here. So that's where I'm saying we don't need to subtract that value twice because we've already got it. I'm sorry, do we have that for the correct variant? Piece value VAR. Piece value VIR. Yeah, okay, so we do have that right. Um, so I think that should be okay. Welcome. You've joined us just as we're in the throes of um, doing some other complicated refactoring stuff. So. Um, last eval is used here, 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 and here. Um, whatever, for purposes of uh, seeing a patch, here's our patch. So prevent the early return statement. Do an assignment here that does not require us to do a negation that we've already performed earlier. Um, <laughs> so let me break this into two parts. Here's how we make sure we haven't broken stuff, or at least have some sanity in what we're testing. This will ultimately need to be added, but for purposes of just testing the refactor. We'll leave that out for now, so I'm just saying if zero to disable that. Um, so what I'm testing is this balance value, which is assigned earlier, um, which already has this particular quantity negated, uh, we can use. Um, and we're saying if this evaluation plus um, the value of the piece that's capturing our piece is less than the threshold return false and such, like we always used to be doing. Um, status. Um, I'm sorry that this isn't making sense at the moment. Oh, do you know about any chances of extinction chests coming to leech us uh, that you'd be willing to share? Um, well, I do know one thing, and that's uh, the last time uh, the site's owner, Thibaut uh, Duplessis, if I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, I apologize. Uh, last time he gave a speech, or sorry, he was doing a participating in a talk show uh, with the Perpetual Chess podcast. Um, they were asking him about what variants or what changes are you looking at adding? Um, and he said that we were considering adding um, Sierra One Chess. Um, so I'll say, like, ex as far as Extinction Chess goes, is, I don't know that Lee Chess is thinking about it. Um, but yeah, what brought up Extinction Chess is probably you're seeing my stream title, which I forgot to update. Um, yeah, a lot of people are very excited about CR1 Chess. I've actually played the variant online. Uh, there's a variant chess server. Um, the Capablanca chess server it runs very much like Fix. Um, I've played it online before. Um, I was very excited about it at first. Um, but I actually think that National Master Chernoff, Zug Addict, is correct on this, that um, that it's not as exciting as we hope it is, or hope it to be. Um, let me go update my stream title, though.
There we go. Yeah, and I think larger chess boards are kind of a huge obstacle too. Um, I think the variant that would make the most sense, or I'm sorry, that would be the most exciting, in my opinion, would be dark chess, the fog of war chess. Um, I think that would be exciting. Let's see, test.sh. Nope, nope, nope. There we go. And extinction atomic. There we go. Run this. So compile the patch. Make sure that my refactor does not change the benchmark numbers. And then we can test whether my patch does change the benchmark numbers, preferably back to what they used to be. Um, yeah, okay, so this here doesn't appear to be breaking anything. Uh, I know that tests execute much, very quickly here, one second per thing. So if we want to do more testing, what we can do to be more thorough would be 16 megabyte hash, single threaded, depth of 16 instead of depth of a default of 13. So let's go rerun the test, and make sure it all does the same thing. Basically what I'm proving out here is that, um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, and uh, judo chess, I've been joking about judo chess being an excellent thing for Lee chess. I think it would be hilarious and very fun and enjoyable. Especially because Lee Chess is like the fastest chess server out there. Um, I don't think Lee Chess would be capable of handling it, but I think it would be a fantastic, fun version. It's a fun game to play. I just don't think Lee Chess can handle it in analysis and stuff. It, it, everything would all break. Um, but yeah, Judo Chess is fun. It's just not something Lee Chess is geared toward doing. Um, okay, so, so this here change, um, this does not positively or negatively impact the bench. Um, zero, one, so now I'll merge that in to get rid of the early return statement, recompile and see what have I broken. Oh, in fact, where's our test here? Sorry for the blinding light again. Here we are. Let's get this diff. And the reason I want this diff is because I want, um, Darn it, this only shows the three things that got changed. Now here's the here's the base number. Can I get the full number, please? I want that number. I can see it over here. Um, so we're comparing um, latest something that got patched versus this was the base tag number. Um, so what I can next test here um, is what happens if we check out that number. Oh, did I copy that number right? Does this start with the letter? Oh no, there's just some white spaces out there, or a tab character or something. Okay, so that, I did get that right. This is what I'm going to be testing next to make sure that my bench numbers are still the same as what they were prior to my merging upstream stuff. Actually, that's not going to work, but because uh, there's other upstream changes I need to be concerned about. Uh, only one of which actually affects what I'm testing here. Uh, uh, 
get add position, get diff cached, um, get log, um, all right, wait, has Fabian submitted an atomic patch? If not, why not? Oh, here we are. Fabian's already on top of this, isn't he? Doing the same thing that I was doing. Oh, never mind. Okay, well, he's right. Yep, yep, yep. This is reverting uh, latest master, that's cool. So, whatever. Means I probably don't need to be bothered doing this, or at least that doesn't belong in this branch. Um, so, yeah, we'll just say we'll get around to this whenever we get around to it. Oh, I'm sorry. There is a way I can still test this. Get check out B simple C branch number two. Get commit. Do not return. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, prevent atomic C from re early, um, no, prevent is wrong, and atomic C do not return early, um, this honestly has nothing to do with the issue I was trying to fix, which was 502, which was having to do with kings. Uh, so... Not sure what to do there. Sorry. AWS? No, we're just running everything on our own clusters here. And my own PC. Um... that's okay. So just out of curiosity more than anything else, let's conclude this test. Um, actually, um, oh, whoops, whatever. Um, where am I now on my branch? Now I'm in sync with master. Um, get check out atomic C, get branch delete simple C number two. All right, so here I want to try um, uh, what was it? What, oh, what was it? Oh, right. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, is this here thing? If atomic um, do not return early. Okay. Uh, get commit. Do not return early in atomic C. Okay, so what I'm trying to test here um, is whether this might restore something that resembles what used to be on master. Um, one other thing changed, and that had to do with 
singular extension evaluation, which was what? Yeah, this thing here. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, this changed twice upstream. First, this changed. Yeah, okay. Git revert this thing. Okay, wow, this is going to suck. Uh, okay, so why didn't that revert properly? Um, right, so this here should be depth is less than 3 ply. And like that, and like this. Um, okay, get and search, get revert, continue. Okay, get blog. There was one other thing we have to revert on this branch, which was um, lower razor to this. Um, so we're going to say git revert that as well. So we're reverting the stuff that potentially could have broken shit. So get status vim search that's pp. This um, this didn't revert properly because our variable names are different. In we have different parameters to be worried about. Um, uh, futility margin factor that was unchanged. Uh, what else? Actually, screw all this. Um, Get check out master. Get revert abort. Check out the master branch. And this new branch that I created, which I called atomic C, is going to be deleted. Um, get check out older version of master. Get check out atomic C vim position .cpp. rather than trying to revert things to make them similar to what they used to be. Why don't we just start from an older version of master? Because that's what we're going to be comparing anyway. Um, yeah, so this is before things. Um, Wait. Um. Okay. Where did my other atomic chest thing go? The one I had for this first comparison. I had something there, and I forget what introduced it. So let's take a look. Do I need to cherry pick one of my own commits? Is that what's going on here? Um, so here's C greater than or equal to. Where is the atomic thing that took? Here it is. So this line of code. Let's get blame for this. Unfortunately, that has to expand the git blame for the entire file. That's okay. 
I just want to know um, when did this get introduced? Oh, this is when I did the merge. Okay, so I'm not sure why that was missing. Um, weird. What the heck? Did I grab the wrong commit number? That's the commit number. Um, okay. Git checkout master. Git checkout delete atomic C. Git checkout this one. Um, which is also going to be the number that we're going to use for our testing here. Um, and then we create this as a new branch atomic C. And somewhere around line 2000 here we encounter, here it is, our comparison, um, which we need to apply. Position as we get commit. Do not to return early in atomic static exchange evaluation. All right, so this was the patch that I wanted to test. Uh, diff. We see there's the one three lines of code that I changed. Um, what I'm endeavoring to test here. Okay, uh, get log. Is that what I patched? Um, hmm. Yeah, I didn't quite nail it, did I? Um, hmm. Let's see, when did things get merged here? Reformat C. This is really what I want. Um, get reset head minus one. Get stash clear. Get stash. So I'll stash that commit away. Um, get revert this bullshit. Um, get status and search .cpp. So this number used to be 600. Uh, so we'll put that back to 600. Um, anything else? Alright, this needs to be a 4 instead of a 3. Uh, but that was the only other thing that changed here was that those two numbers. Um, and yeah, there's nothing else to merge. Git revert revert continue. Git stash apply. Git add position. Git commit. Uh, do not return early in atomic static exchange evaluation. Get log. All right, so what we want to compare is atomic C versus um, before I had started to merge upstream stuff, which was. The latest stable commit, I guess, would be this one. Um, so we'll use that. All right, so what this should prove um, let's see, am I doing this in debug enabled? I really should. Just to be safe, um, just in case 
there is actually some kind of uh, assertion that gets thrown at runtime or something like that. So we're building the older master and comparing that older master to this patched master, which should both return the same uh, values. So, um, and then I can put this up on GitHub just to inform Fabian that long term this would be a reasonable sort of patch to apply, um, I think. Okay, so our numbers differ. What the fuck? We're off by four. Um, okay. What lines of code changed here? This should only include the non-functional changes. I mean, that's horde chess. That doesn't affect atomic chess at all. Um, that's horde chess again. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So... They changed the parameters of min attacker and such. Almost all of what changed is related to horde chess. Um, so how is any of this a functional change with regard to atomic chess? I'm not seeing it. Um, Let's do this comparison, ignoring white space changes. I'm sorry that we're flying through all this pretty quickly, although this is like the 20th time I've seen this code. There's our latest patch, by the way, that prevents the early return. Here's another patch I put in at some point during merging, which also prevented an early return. Um, Yeah, I just don't know. So all these lines of code moved around, all these assertions... I'm sorry, all the comments got changed. Um, interesting that we're missing an assertion now. Not that we need it. I'm no, sorry, that assertion moved. I remember where it's at now. Um, okay. Yeah, all this stuff had to do with horde chess, though. Not with atomic. So, so the point, or the value in this exercise is actually demonstrating that there is a difference. That's interesting. Uh, why the fuck is there a difference? Just looking at the code, it's not obvious what changed. Um, but comparing our results of our tests, we see that this Nodes searched here ends in 920, and this one ends in 924. Which is bad, because it means we're not searching the same number of nodes per, per position before and after changes. Um, it's status. All right, get check out master. Get branch delete 
atomic C um, okay we're gonna try a different way of testing this get check out even older version of this check out branch atomic C um, now what we want to merge um, is this here first. So get um, cherry pick this commit status. We'll repeat this entire. Oh fuck! This is this is going to be arduous. Well, no. It's just three blocks of code. I can afford to do this. Um, okay. How did I do this the first time? Because we can, if we did it once, we can do it twice. This is the older. This is my fork of Stockfish and what this code looks like. Side to move is equal to negate the color of the piece on the from square. On uh, the official stockfish it looks like this. Um, except uh, this is the else case for crazy house. Um, here's how I resolved this last time. Color us is equal to the color of the moved piece this comment gets moved. So here we have, if we're doing crazy house, or if crazy house is part of the build, then consider what the color of our piece is. Otherwise, consider the color of our piece this way. And if color side to move is equal to the color that's not the color of our piece, so we don't need this defined here. And balance is still defined the way it used to be defined. And occupied and STM attackers have moved. Um, us, STM. OK. So that's how I merged that the first time. And then down here. What I merged the first time was jeez. Opponent to move is no longer part of this stag exchange evaluation routine. Um if we're doing crazy house and we're dropping a piece, the occupancy does not change based on the from square because dropping a piece you don't have a from square. Um so we need to get rid of a uh, the variable opponent to move. Uh, Bitboard occupied. Oh, sorry. So we have to. Two, three, four, five. Grab these five lines of code. Uh, grab this line of code. And we still have to declare occupied. Uh, comments and the definition and all that change, but what we're doing to actually, yeah, so if we're dropping a piece, don't change the occupied bit board based on the piece that you're moving, because you're not moving a piece from a square on the board. You're moving it from your hand. Otherwise, um, define the occupied bit board the way we normally do. All right, and then down here, side to move is equal to not side to move and assert value is balance is less than zero how does this change how does any of this change um we still need this atomic chess assertion somewhere for if the next victim is the king um don't freak out sort of thing. 
Um, but where did that condition move to? Um, where did that next victim is the king check get moved to? Not there. If next victim is king and players attack, okay. I see. Yeah, the way this is supposed to work with standard chess is that the king doesn't have a value. So if our balance is etc. etc. then okay, but yeah, this I'm just saying don't freak out if your king gets captured. Although this is unnecessary, isn't it? Because in atomic chess the king has a non zero value. Um, well, regardless. Maybe there's a reason to have that. I think there is, still. I'm going to fail to explain it, even though I'm almost certain I'm right. Um, okay, and when we look for the value of our piece, consider what variant we're playing. Um... None of the rest of this had been changed for variants. So get rid of my forks version of the code and substitute the upstream version. Get add position.cpp. Get cherry pick can double dash continue. Uh, okay. So we've merged that. Um, having that particular base in place, now we can do get stash apply, uh, and then get diff to see that's the prevention of the early return for atomic chess. Um, somewhere around line 2000, if I remember right. Here it is, and we're saying for atomic chess, do something different here anyway, um, which is set balance equals value zero, so we don't return early. Um, so what this is supposed to be trying to do is to find if I'm capturing something. Um, oh, I see. Uh, remember the value of the piece that I'm capturing. If I'm capturing something. Um, it really should be more like this. Although, do I even care about that threshold later on? Where are, what do we do for atomic chess? I think we call a different routine entirely in most cases. Yeah, here we are. All this had to move around anyway. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I mismerged. Oh, that's great. Um, so how did I misburge this? Um, get stash clear, get stash. This doesn't even compile, does it? Um, here, let's grab our compile statement and see like how this fails to compile, because I missed something of, with respect to how I did this the first time. I missed some critical details here. Wait. Yeah, there we are. Occupied is not defined in this scope. So upstream moved around where they declared variables. I needed to reorder some statements to get this to work. Namely, I needed these occupied and stuff things to be defined first. And so I could do that. It became necessary 
that I move my big block of atomic code from where it was. 1975, 1938, it's like 45-ish lines of code. Is that right? Uh, I just find it hard to believe that I got that right the first time. Yeah, okay, balance is equal to this, that, and the other. Oh, never mind. Yeah, if, um, 1975 versus 1938. That's 30-something lines of code. Yeah, complete 39 lines of code. Move those 39 lines of code down here. Um, but also, because I'm moving the code around, um, I need to make sure that we're not returning early, is the point. So, this here should be, well, Status, get and position at CPP, get commit amend, get stash apply. Um, whoops, I appear to be editing two files because I typoed. Where did I fuck things up here somewhere? Um, Stash changes. Okay, fine. Get diff. Huh. No changes. Okay. Um. That's far more than I had intended to change. Status. Um. Grab the better part of this, which was, where was it? It's prior to the, no. Sorry if I'm rambling. Uh, okay. So we'll just have to patch this manually. That's okay. So here we have, if we're doing crazy house, do some stuff differently. Wait, what? Oh, right, right, right. Uh, if def atomic, and if. Uh, if we're playing atomic chess. Else, find balance differently. Is equal to minus threshold. Um, mm -hmm. Do I care if it's a capture? Whoa. Did I miss something here? Oh, just got a message. It's okay. All right. Um, Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, balance is equal to value zero. Because we don't consider captures this way. We do captures differently for atomic chess. Um, but also don't return early over here either. No, no, no. Okay, I, I fucked up so many different times here. What I really should be doing is just prevent early returns here. And an early return there. 
and do whatever it is we do with balance understanding that balance here should okay the one thing I did fix is kind of a loose term for this but that code the fact that I had that huge else block that was like needlessly indented for the typical use case was ridiculous so as we're moving code around we indent it properly I know Vim, particularly in the way I'm using it here, is not very sexy or efficient. Um, blast underscore eval becomes blast eval. Um, let's see. Am I missing something else? I don't even remember. I don't remember how I merged this the first time. I think this is pretty close. The important part is that this bit board called occupied is already defined here and already initialized. Um, <sighs> what I am missing is why did I initialize occupied this way? pieces. Um, oh, okay, I guess this is fine. Um, mm -hmm. This is okay. So I've declared bitboard occupied and now I've initialized it properly. Um, And am I missing anything else? We have attackers defined, which are all the attackers um, hitting or that are still on occupied squares. Um, so this is simply attackers of our opponent. Um, there were various other things that were fucked up here that we fixed. Um, I'm sorry, like here we have a variable for us or our color, so we might as well use that. Um, Uh, and if this is our color, yeah, I think that was what was necessary here. Just given how right. Um, Side to move is equal to our color. Value of color of piece on the from square. Um, and side to move is the opponent of us. Right, so is there anything else there? No, that was fine then. Um, all right. So, I know I'm doing tons of coding and very little explaining things, um, but I think this is making progress. And the way to test that um, is to do a regression test here, which we shall do. Status, get and position, that's P. Um, okay. Get log. Alright, so. Um, 
Um, right, so we're intending to compare with this. Which I think was the number we previously had in there, but you know, for completeness sake, we'll just retype it. All right, and recompile the engine and make sure that it produces the same numbers as the previous build. Which is what I should have done from the very beginning and somehow I fucked up this step too. It's been an extremely long week for reasons I don't need to get into. And I apologize for um, burdening you with that. Uh, let's check out what's going on out here. Phantom Bot's got a new release. Is that the case? Uh, Phantom Bot was released. Nice. And we've collected user feedback and bug reports and fixed them in the new release. Check them out below. Nice, nice, nice. I'll pull this all down sometime soon. Not right now. <laughs> well, oh, there we are. We broke it. 1943 US dot. Uh, anything else? Oh, that's cool. Add position at speed, get commit comment, test at sh. No need to rebuild everything else. Um, just compile it, and if this compiles, redo the test. This should not be difficult to compile. All right, so we're off by four again. How? Um. What's so different here? What did I change? How... I'm very confused. This should not be a functional change. Well, I'm sorry, why am I looking at code? Code's not going to answer my questions. Evidence will answer my questions. So, sort of evidence that we're looking for is um, that the numbers are different here. That it takes a different number of nodes to search each position, which is completely bonkers, and it's not even close. Um, so uh, let's go here and reconduct that test uh, with a lower depth. Um, yeah, the numbers aren't anywhere near each other. Um, oh, on the bright side. At least the numbers differ at a very low depth, so we should be able to detect this easily. But figuring out what it is that I fucked up, even here, even now, you think this should be fairly obvious at this point. There's not much left. How could I have fucked anything up? Um, so don't return early. Don't return early. Define the occupied bit board. Redefine the occupied bit board. Which is okay because we always return here, so we can define occupied to be whatever we want it to be. Um, if threshold is greater than value zero. Uh, return false. Wait, how does that match up to anything that we had up here? 
Um, I'm so confused. I must have changed something terribly obvious. So we're calling this entire other routine. We're completely rejecting the value of this thing called balance. We in no way are using that for atomic chess. Um, this value of attackers uh, is equivalent to what we used to have, which was attackers to the destination square based on the occupied, based on squares being filled in. Um, and we only want the pieces that are still on their original squares. So here we redefine occupied. Um, oh. Well, no, that shouldn't have any effect. Shouldn't have any effect at all. The fact that we're using attackers based on this definition. Whatever, just in case it does mean something. Um, bit board B is equal to this stuff, and that uses the new occupied definition, which is okay. That can't possibly be a functional change, but, you know, in case it is, we'll look at it that way. All right, so for each attacker and attackers, do stuff that's intelligent. Isn't there also a bit board of, like, side-to-move attackers? Um, regardless. Position CPP. Um, at least this should be simple to test. Moving around code, yeah, it still has a functional impact. What the heck? How is it that, like, this obviously disables the the return statement below? As does this, obviously, disable the return statement below. Um, so what gives? We're not using the value of balance anywhere in this is atomic block here. Um, we're not changing the value of threshold in any of those lines of code. So how could it be that this here patch I mean the thing I gotta watch out most for is the us versus side to move distinction here. Um, where previously this was saying side to move is equal to the color of our piece and then negating side to move to be the opposite of side to move. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I should take a closer look at what we used to have. Um, so that would be Side to move is equal to color of the piece on the from square. And we want pieces of our opponent's color, um, which I've successfully translated here based on don't initialize side to move, which is already initialized to the color of our opponent's pieces. Um, so I've already done that as I should. And you're saying if color is our color, 
decrease um, blast eval, otherwise increase it. Whereas previously this would say if color is equal to side to move, which would be our color, do the following. Um, Okay. So I'm confused. How how does this return a different bench? Okay, looking at codes, I'm sorry, I keep getting myself sidetracked. I'm thinking there's some easy, obvious explanation. There isn't. At least not yet. There will be, but I'm so eager to be done with this that I'm skipping the important step of narrowing down exactly where the problem lies, which honestly is what's going to help us the most here, is getting a simple, concrete observation of the problem. So here we have bench position 4 of 9, 4 of 9, the search is 172, the search is 168. That's our difference of 4 in this case. So we can go over to benchmark.cpp, uh, look for our atomic chest position number one, two, three, four. Grab this. Atomic.epd, paste this. Um, there we go. Um, and then we can say, not just test all the positions, but test specifically atomic.epd. I'm sorry, FEN is what I should call this. Uh, only atomic.epd atomic.fen and there's a more simple description of the issue which is that we're searching hard say 87 positions instead of whatever um, still doesn't answer exactly what was going on there, but we're narrowing it down a bit. At depth 2, we're searching fewer positions than we used to be searching. As for why, your guess is as good as mine. Um, again, I'm trying to think that there must be something simple here. There really isn't. Um, I'm sorry, no. Um, cat atomic dot fen. Let's take a look at this position, and we're better to look at it. Um, then on Leechus. So we're back at Leechus. Here's our atomic chest position. So, what's so special about it? I don't know. Something special about this, but not about other positions. I mean, we can castle. That's a thing. I don't know. Invent a theory. Test it somehow. Um, but the important part is to do the testing. Um, and um, hmm. oh, I'm sorry. At depth one, we have a difference. Um, Sorry, I'm so exhausted at this point. I missed the obvious. You'll have to forgive me for that. Alright, so we're analyzing 83 positions originally, and now in this branch we're analyzing 79 positions. So that's four entire positions that um, something's different. Oh man, I hope this isn't what I think it is.
which is a random behavior. That would suck. Uh, but in case it is something random that might be mitigated by disabling optimization, let's disable optimization. Uh, just in case. We found with Horde Chess there was something uh, the, the optimizations were causing random behavior. Um, and I hope that's not the case here. So I've disabled all the optimization flags so things get initialized properly. Okay, thank goodness that wasn't it. Because if that were the case then I mean, yes, we'd know what the problem is, but fixing it would be a mess. But we would know what the problem is, which would be a good thing. Um, so another thing we can do to test this is like change our test position and see um, what effects, if any, are had by changing the test. Like, what if I get rid of castling rights when we redo the test? I shouldn't have recompiled everything. That was stupid on my part. Um, I can comment out the first few compilation steps here. Um, and I will do that. But if I take away castling, king, queen, king, queen. Okay, that doesn't fundamentally change the nodes searched being different. Um, so what else could have an effect? Um, what else could change our bench number? What specifically about this test position is so fantastic? Um, And I apologize for going back and staring at the code again, but I'm trying to look for some kind of inspiration here. Because it was something between... Um, so between, like, this line of code and between where... Oh, I'm sorry, this and, like, a few dozen lines below. Something pretty fundamental must have changed here. Um, that's not like we're using balance anywhere, right? P A L A. Yeah, it's not used within the scope of this being an atomic chess game. So, if we're playing atomic chess, we can ignore everything below this here return statement. Um, So, what else should there be to consider here? Um, are there other files that were changed? And could those other files have had any effect? There was bitboard.h. Uh, I'd hate to think that something in Bitboard age could have changed something here. There's position.cpp where they used least significant bit instead of this extended expression. That's not a functional change. Um, let's see, this here, they just renamed a variable, they added a comment. Um, I renamed a variable of my own, STM attackers. STM attackers isn't a thing anymore, is it? That's something that got removed with 
Um, oh no, no, it's still used. Never mind. That's new, in fact. Um, okay. So here what changed was that we're defining this thing called us and then saying side to move is not us. Not a drastic change at all. Um, though it does mean we have visibility to this new variable called us, but that's okay. Um, to find this variable called balance after all of that. Um, so for atomic chess, we're avoiding all this short circuit evaluation. And as always, we're redefining occupied down here. Um, and I didn't change anything logically inside the scope. Um, And then none of the rest of this matters at all because this is only executes for variants which are not atomic chess. So none of that matters at all. Okay, which is what perplexes me most. So how do I try to troubleshoot this? I mean, I could add debugging that prints out every time we encounter this function, but that's going to be a lot of printing and a lot of data to cipher or, or to siphon through, cipher through. I don't know. I'm tired. <laughs> Not sure where to go with this. Other than say, you know, we have to just like cry uncle for now and. I don't know, po I maybe post a comment later once I figure it out what in the world is going on here. It's just so far beyond me. I just don't understand what's going on. Um, I just, what is going on here? I'd like to know. And that's what bugs me the most. Like, even if I terminate the stream, I'm not going to stop thinking about this, because I, um, it just troubles me that moving around lines of code and not changing them still has a functional impact somehow. Maybe, maybe what this means is that whatever is consuming this function, um, expects a different threshold to be passed into the function. Um, like maybe there's an off by one, plus one, minus one thing going on that's different. Um, if not, then I'm just terribly confused. What do we do in the not atomic chess case? I know all this got rewritten. Um, this is all about, is your balance greater than zero? And what color do we end up with at the end of this function? Um, let's see. Oh, if atomic. So I could actually just add an else here to skip this while block. And I wouldn't need my own return statement, and I could still just return if us is equal to or not equal to side to move. 
Um, that said, that's not any better. Um, But if I had to, I could try to change this block to more resemble the block below it. But that doesn't help me at all. Um, so... I think I did something like this. Only because um, this function did provide this new variable for me. I don't need to allocate one of my own. Um, but that's not a functional change. Uh, this here, where we're defining occupied and then redefining occupied because there was nothing on the two square to begin with. It's a bit there's no way that if I comment this out um, that we'll get the functionality we seek. But um, theoretically that shouldn't, I shouldn't need that. Um, because we've already established up here this move is not a capture, so the two square is empty. So this occupied value, whatever. Um, okay, let's try it just in case. Yeah, so as suspected, that has no impact. Um, um, so we don't need to reinitialize occupied there. Um, which in turn means it's fine to just say attackers here. That's functionally equivalent to this assignment that changes. Okay. Um, so now what? I'm still at a loss as to, like, what I've changed here. Or I'm also at a loss as to how to break this down into meaningful data points that I can troubleshoot live during a stream. There's just in thousands and thousands of data points. I couldn't possibly connect them manually while we're working on this together. Um, I am very flustered that just my moving a block of code uh, down a few lines and then using shorts, then using this to avoid this um, early return, and using this to avoid an early return um, hasn't been good enough. That somehow, somehow I broke it. And I'm just very confused. I don't know what to suggest. Uh, blast is equal to adjacent to destination and not a pawn and not our origin square and not or not the origin square of this move and not the origin square of the attacker so then blast envelops everything else um, The, if the blast envelops our king, um, we're not going to perform that capture. 
except this is their piece. <sighs> what gives? How did this used to read? I think this used to say not side to move or something. Maybe that's the key here. Side to move is equal to our color. We're not negating this at any point. If it involves their king, continue. Okay, so I have this backwards. That's my problem. Uh, like this. If it envelops their own king, they're not performing that capture. Else, if it envelops our king, we've got a problem. That's the deal. That's the real deal. So, next question. I'll continue and then return, I see. So, I have that same ordering. Um... <laughs> it's funny that I have a continue statement here when I could just as easily say break. Because, you know, if the blast envelops their king, like, it's always going to envelop their king. There's no point um, in continuing on to the next piece. Um... Like, if, if you move a queen next to their king, and if they can't capture it with one of their pieces, because taking your queen would explode their king, taking it with any of their pieces would explode their king. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of silly. Continue and break do the same thing there. Um, so, question, how is it that this deals with the king doing a capture? Oh my goodness. How many problems can I find with my code? The blast envelops the king, that's the end of that. Um, but if you play your queen next to their king, like... Well, okay, we could handle that. We don't need to, but we could. Um... STM attackers. Oh, that's how we deal with their king. As if, um, if their king is included in the attackers, then exclude it explicitly. Um, that's so that's not a smart way to deal with it. Uh. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think that's fine. This whole statement is just stupid. That shouldn't be in the while loop, it should be above it. Whatever. We'll leave it as is. It doesn't really matter, because in most positions you aren't going to loop a second time. Um, 
so yeah, I guess this just goes to show don't code when you're like super exhausted. Um, I promise you I'm not drunk, even if it might sound or look or whatever like it. That's just not something I do. Um, but yeah, what this here means... Um, well, side to move attackers. Um, mm -mm. Here. Um, yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter if we continue or break. Might as well break. So this just gives the compiler better chances for optimization. Um, blast radius includes their king. Which in turn means, um, well, yeah, we're going to remove king from this list of attackers to begin with. Um, uh, let's see. just like if side to move attackers already includes the king you know that like the king is in the blast radius so every capture is going to fail um this is like the least idiomatic code ever exclude King from attackers. Although, if King is an attacker, uh, note that excludes King from attackers. Although, but king is uh, when king is in blast radius. Surely, uh, um. But if um, when king is adjacent to uh, target square, um, Although, if king is adjacent, why bother? Yeah, I think that gets the message across. Uh, yeah, that's just weird. Like, what's the point? Um, we'll just leave this as continue for now. I'm not needing to change that. Alright, so then we'll go back to our test script. Testing is hard. Just saying. 
uh, redo this test, um, see that I have not changed the bench numbers, which goes back to our first point that um, just adding that simple comparison um, uh, that we are playing atomic chess, so don't return early. Should be fine. Okay. So fine, whatever. Um, didn't need that. Oops, so now we can push this. Um, okay. Just to do our due diligence, because you know, why not? Um, get log. Stockfish bench. What's our bench number this time? That's going to take a little bit longer to execute. Uh, we're just testing for non regression. In fact, let's just do number of games 10,000 games, whatever. Um, redo upstream merge. From upstream. Um, no functional change. So this works, this works. Um, status, get log, we've pushed this to GitHub already. Um, let's see. Ready to merge from upstream. Do not return early regression test. There we go. Um, so then if you go to this here diff, you get to see just what it means to merge this particular change. Um, it's not that hard to look at. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, that's not my looking at it. That's the other test that we're looking at. No, yeah, it's this thing here. So, redo merge from upstream, do not return early, etc., etc. Um, so that's cool. I think that at least answers the question. Um, let me go back to my repository. Um, there's all kinds of fun projects on GitHub, by the way. Not just this. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> I think this would have been the correct um, to better understand what is going on here. I redid the merge from upstream in this branch. I re-merge from upstream and verify that bench numbers do not change 
I have submitted regression test here. Uh, submitted a regression test. Uh, where'd it go? I lost it. Uh, here it is. This one, copy. Okay. There we go. Think that covers that. Think we understand how to merge code. C++, beautiful as it is, functional as it is, um, makes it super easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, shoot in foot. There's a whole... Um, Oh no, there's a meme or whatever you want to call it going out about this. Um, yeah, here we are. How to pages. Uh, how to shoot yourself in the foot. So, C, uh, you shoot yourself in the foot. C++, you accidentally create a dozen instances of yourself and shoot them all in the foot. Providing emergency medical care is impossible because you can't tell which are bitwise copies and which are just pointing at the others and saying, that's me over there. So yeah, there, there's this whole meme about various programming languages um, and ways to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, newer languages make it easier to test, make it harder for you to do stupid things. C++ um, makes it easy for you to do whatever it is that you're aiming to do. Which, in most cases, honestly, is shooting yourself in the foot because you can't keep track of everything. Newer languages help you keep track of things better. They're more restrictive about how you develop software. Anyway, no need to belabor the point. Um, but yeah. Um... These coding exercises would be more fun if I were to do them in more modern languages. But Stockfish is the state of the art chess AI at the moment. So it's in C++. We stick with C++. We just have to be really freaking careful about testing things extremely pedantically. Otherwise, you shoot yourself in the foot, and it hurts. And um, you do have to fix it can't just leave things buggy but yeah providing enterprise grade support for a hobby project is kind of crazy um, but we learn things through doing this and what basically the biggest thing we learn um, is just that we don't despite how many things I script together using shell scripts and test files and submitting tests to the server and all that, n none of that is going to substitute for using a more modern languages, or using a more modern language um, capable of much more pedantic um, uh, validation. Well, pedantic something or other. Making sure you follow idiomatic programming constructs and such. Um, so the fact that I had to watch out for all those side effects and um, I don't know, just really completely understand what I'm doing. Um, and it's just too difficult a task for one person. Um, I don't know. Oh, the other upshot of all of this, and I apologize if this sounds negative, I'm really starting to think, rethink the whole app fair thing. So, official Stockfish has an app fair where you can download any build um, for the official Stockfish. It's a beautiful thing for official Stockfish repository. Uh, I know I'm saying that with official Stockfish, but I'm looking. Oh, this is theirs. Yeah, here we are. This is the one. Um, they have all the testing resources and code reviewers and maintainers and everything to make this possible and reasonable. 
I, on the other hand, with my silly little fork, you can easily go here and download any of my buggy stuff. Um, and you can shoot yourself in the foot. And I'm just thinking, you know, it made so much sense for official Stockfish to have this app there. Why do I have it? I mean, I, yes, I know it makes this easier for people to download Windows binaries for my repository. But Fabian and I are just two maintainers doing this, like, yeoman's work here. It's... If people want Windows binaries, my god, we've got to get enterprise-grade testing software or tools or something, because... Uh, it's just far too much for any one person to understand. Like, we've got 1,234 commits ahead of upstream. Tens of thousands of lines of code to worry about, both that we've changed and that they've changed. And I do my best, and obviously it's not good enough, and people can easily just go here and download these binaries that do God knows what on your machine. And I just don't know what to do about that. I don't understand why we have this anymore. Yes, I know it's because I'm not doing Windows builds on my PC for people. And people have repeatedly asked how do I get a Windows build and you just go here to get it now, but the fact that people can get Windows builds of something that's not ready for release is just horrifying. Because, like, nobody knows what the program does. We're just not at a level where we can consistently do release or stable or whatever. Every one of these builds, until the release, as far as I can see, is an alpha build. Um, maybe pre-alpha. I just don't know what to do about that. Like, if upstream they're changing radical things. Um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. They do need to make, they do need to pay technical debt. But we don't have the resources to keep up with that. Um, and I just don't know what to do about that other than just taking away the Windows builds through AppFair and saying, you know, if you want to build this, you're also responsible for testing it. I just, I don't know. I'm making it really easy for people to do things that could hurt their uh, computers. I'm doing my best, but there's a difference between having something that's always available and just doing something as best as I can as a hobby outside of my normal job. I just don't know what to do here. Um, I don't really see the value in this, particularly because every few months uh, Lee Chess and I get together and um, some builds occur once we're in some kind of stable configuration. Um, and that build goes out onto leechess.org and you can do live computer analysis of positions like so here's your analysis board you can request stockfish analysis on the fly here uh, there's also cloud analysis and such but like all this integrates beautifully with the leechess platform they actually help me out um, and they even help me out when I fuck up and need to do another build. Um, so the fact that like you can go to Leech Us and get these analyses, and the fact that you can like download the Leech Us app, um, which includes this engine, um, at least at times where they've helped me create a more stable build, is great. But this app veyer thing where you can just get a build or get a binary corresponding to any build, it's scaring me a bit. 
and the fact that I can't like get patches out in a timely manner because we're encumbered. I don't know. It's just like this is way too much for any of us here. Um, I just don't see the value in having the app fair build. I just don't get it. I get that that's useful for Windows people who want to be able to run this on Windows, but we just don't have the ability to keep pace with what Upstream is doing. Like, and the other thing is we got all these variants for like Extinction Chess and such. It's wonderful we have all these variants, but uh, it means that every time we go to merge something, our chances of breaking something increase. And so, I I mean, one solution would be that, um, I don't know, I find some way to, like, create another repository or another master branch or something. Something where we do development. Um, but people still go to the Atveyor thing and they'll still give them their builds, unfortunately. And, I don't know, another solution would be just turn off Atveyor until we have a stable build and then turn it back on and then turn it off again. Um, and that might be the only way to go until we have a stable product. Because um, yeah, I don't know how it is that we're going to manage to keep pace with what Upstream is doing. I've been saying that for quite some time. And um, I mean, we're going to certainly do the best we can but this is actually getting pretty popular and we're having to deal with this reality that like keeping pace is challenging particularly because we're adding all these um, well not all, it's not a matter of we add variants which does complicate every time we go to merge something because um, if we have twice as many variants that's twice as many things to think about but that's also twice as many features that the community can enjoy. So that's a positive thing. It's just like, I'm trying to contrast that with the fact that we are doing these builds that anybody can download. And, like, it's like we need an end user license agreement or something saying, you know, if this deletes your hard drive, don't sue us. I don't know. That's kind of what makes me nervous here. Um, I'm certainly doing my due diligence to try to respond to things as quickly as possible, but um, I'm not sure where we can go with this. Certainly we'll continue to try to make this available and um, support it as best as we can, but um, one thing I'm looking at increasingly um, is maybe we try porting this to something I don't know where testing it is easier um, so I have created this fork of rustfish um, I've not yet started to do development here but um, at least we're able to see that we get the same bench numbers and such as um, the official Stockfish repository. And maybe, just maybe, um, the Lee Chess folks will be receptive to us working on Rustfish instead of Stockfish or something. I don't know. Um, is it even possible to do, like, Travis builds and App Fair builds and such with Rust? I don't know. Um, uh, maybe this isn't the right way to go. It's just a lot to think about, and I don't know. I'm not sure how best to think about all the all these perspectives all at once, as I immerse myself into the total perspective vortex and try to figure out all these things. It's just a lot to figure out, and it's not nearly as bad as I'm making it out to be, but it's just like I 
And I certainly appreciate that we have this wonderful test server and that people donate their resources toward it. Uh, multivariant stockfish testing queue. It's an excellent thing. Um, it's just like there's what we're doing is twice as complicated as what they're doing upstream. And unless we, <laughs> I just don't know how we're going to manage to get the talent to keep this going. It's cool that we're, um, I do appreciate that Fabian is like taking these additional variants and working on them inside his repository. Um, I have been beating the drum for quite a while on one particular thing. And that's that we have 14 open issues. Um, I've been doing the best I can to try to assign these to people. Um, make sure that um, the ones that we keep the number assigned to nobody to a minimum. This one can stay assigned to nobody because it's something we're all responsible for is how do we test things. The rest of these, I would accept them all myself, except um, this is enormous. And I think it's okay this one stays open forever because there's no bug here. Um, but yeah, the rest of these that imply perhaps some sort of bug, um, we should think something about them. Um, I don't know anything about GUIs. I have some ideas about usage, but there's really not much to say. I don't know. Um, end game table base not working. I contributed my thoughts on that. We're 41 comments into the discussion. Um, and still not agreed on exactly how it should work. One thing I proposed is that uh, two kings chess might make more sense as a sub variant of uh, standard chess so we don't have so many variants out there but I guess what I'm hearing what we've heard before is that that doesn't simplify anything really um, so I'm not sure what else could well I'm sorry we could make other things like extinction chess a sub variant too um, where you could have multiple kings and so on and so forth. But no, that's too different. Two kings chess is actually pretty similar. It's just one of them's a commoner. One of them's a royal king. Um, and that does change thing how things like castling work. Um, but it does degenerate smoothly into standard chess. It's just, what if you have a... How would you do a two kings table base? How would you test it? And like the table base code is pretty complicated. Um, and that's perhaps what's motivating um, Ronald uh, Demand or Zizigi um, to start looking into um, doing stockfish in Rust. Just that like table bases and other things um, are easier to break apart into smaller pieces and test, uh, unit test them. There's really no way to unit test stockfish. Um, but yeah, other languages impose their idioms on you and make sure that um, will help protect against you doing stupid things. Um, Although I don't think that that's going to matter in the context of an imperative program that already exists and trying to translate their, that from C++ into Rust. But it means that if you're trying to like build on top of this program and add additional features and functionality, at least those um, would be subject to Rust's um, idioms. Uh, so you'd be encouraged to develop them in a, using idioms that make sense and not causing side effects and so on and so forth. Um, I speak of the greatness of functional programming and of, of, um, of modern languages beyond C++. Um, but I'm not an expert in these things yet. 
So I sound like a bumbling idiot, and I apologize for that. At any rate, um, we had some success today. So, huzzah. Um, yeah. We're getting back into the swing of things. So, hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time. Have a good night.